everyone left except for Titi, a little girl who had just arrived with her parents to the village. Unaware of the danger, Titi greeted the queen, who ignored her. Titi asked why the queen didn't reply, but Abiodu ordered Terro to attack her. The snake struck and swallowed Titi. Once upon a time, in the village of Sango, there lived a queen named Abiodu. She was a very powerful and feared ruler because no one in the village could stand against her. Abiodu's husband, King Ishaku, had passed away many years ago, leaving her to rule alone. Abiodu had a pet snake named Tero, which added to her intimidating presence. She had a strict rule for the villagers. They must bring uncooked food to her every day. If anyone failed to do so, she would unleash terror to punish them. One fateful day, Abiodu had a troubling vision. She saw that a child would be born with powers greater than hers, destined to defeat her and take over the throne. Worried about losing her powers, she commanded Terror to kill all the pregnant women and newborn babies in the village. Terror obeyed without question, causing great sorrow and fear among the villagers. However, there was a pregnant woman named Ido who carried the powerful child. When Terror came for her, Ido bravely fought back with a knife, forcing the snake to flee. Terror returned to Abiodu reporting that Idowu was strong and nearly killed it. Hearing this, Abiodu decided to send her guards to kill Idowu the next morning. Early the following day, Idowu, sensing danger, hid as the guards approached. They searched everywhere but couldn't find her. One guard remarked, I can't find anyone. Why another worried about facing the queen's wrath if they failed? Idowu overheard their conversation and realized she had to run. She ran into the fields, chased by the guards. Despite her exhaustion, Idowu managed to lose them temporarily and found a safe spot to rest. It was then that she went into labor. As the guards got closer to where she was, Idowu placed her newborn baby in a basket and set it adrift in a nearby river. To keep it safe she then tried to escape but the guards caught up with her resulting in a tragic end they beheaded her and threw her head into the river the guards proudly presented idowu's head to queen abiodu who confirmed with terror that this was indeed the powerful woman they sought the queen was relieved and felt secure in her rule the next day the villagers were furious at Queen Abiodu for killing their loved ones. They gathered at the palace, shouting and throwing stones. Abiodu, filled with anger, sent his guards after them. They caught some men, and Abiodu fed their bodies to terror. The remaining villagers were terrified and hated the queen more than ever. They wanted to kill her if given the chance. That evening, as Abiodu went to the river, a person warned everyone to flee because the queen was coming. Everyone left except for Titi, a little girl who had just arrived with her parents to the village. Unaware of the danger, Titi greeted the queen, who ignored her. Titi asked why the queen didn't reply, but Abiodu ordered Tero to attack her. The snake struck and swallowed Titi. However, someone watched from afar and rushed to inform Titi's parents. Titi's father, filled with grief and rage, went to the palace. He couldn't find anyone there, so he decided to return later. On his way back, he encountered Queen Abiodu. In a fit of anger, Titi's father shot at the snake and then at Abiodu, but the bullets had no effect. Confused, 
he demanded to know why the gun didn't work. Abiodi, wickedly grinning, taunted him, calling his child arrogant. Titi's father vowed to kill the queen with his own hands. As he longed at her with a knife, Abiodu used her powers to lift him in the air. He begged for mercy, promising never to harm her again. But Abiodu, filled with malice, dropped him to his death. The villagers lived in fear of Abiodu, not daring to speak against her wickedness. One day, the community priest gathered courage and went to the palace to confront her. He spoke of her atrocities and urged her to change her ways. Abiodu, infuriated by his words, ordered her guards to beat him severely. She then commanded the priest to go around the village and spread lies about her being a good queen, allowing people to visit the palace freely. The priest refused, calling her a wicked witch. Threatening to feed him to terror the snake, Abiodu forced the priest to agree. After releasing him, the priest pondered how to handle the queen's tyranny. Meanwhile, Abiodu smugly believed she had the villagers under her control. Days passed with no change in the villagers' behavior. Angering Abiodu, she sent her guards to the priest as a warning, but he remained truthful. Enraged, Queen Abiodu ordered her guards to capture Shegu, the chief priest's son. He fled but was devoured by terror. The news spread like wildfire. The villagers got so scared and they demanded justice. They gathered at the palace gates, accusing Queen Abiodu of evil deeds. She remained silent, using a spirit to injure some villagers. The elders, fearing for their lives, considered making her son the king to appease her. However, one wise elder spoke against it, knowing it would not change Abiodu's ways. She dismissed them, warning that they would beg her eventually. The elders vowed never to return to her palace. The next day, Abiodu ordered her guards to kill the elder sons and bring their daughters to the palace. Queen Abiodu's cruelty reached new heights when she ordered her guards to harm the sons of the elders and capture their daughters. Many sons were injured and the daughters were taken away, causing great distress among the elders. Desperate to free their children, the elders pleaded with Queen Abiodu at the palace. They offered to make her son the new king in exchange for their daughter's release. Biodi pretended to consider their proposal and asked them to return the next day. The elders, though hopeful, realized they didn't want Biodu's son as the king. They feared he would be just as cruel as his mother. So they embarked on a journey to seek help from a wise man named Aduna in Odu village. Upon reaching Odu village, the elders respectfully explained their plight to Aduna. He listened intently and performed a magical ritual that revealed a special baby in a basin of water. Aduna revealed that this baby would end Queen Biodu's reign of terror. Grateful for the guidance, the elders left Odu village, determined to find and protect the prophesied baby. They knew that safeguarding him would be crucial in bringing about positive change for their village. With the guidance of the wise man Aduna, the elders found the special child Iro Lua in a nearby village. He had been lovingly raised by a kind hunter and his wife who agreed to continue nurturing him despite understanding the importance of his destiny. Meanwhile, back in the village, tensions rose as everyone awaited Queen Biodu's next move. The elders, fearing her wrath, sent their children away for safety at dawn. They knew they couldn't trust the queen and were determined to protect their children. In the palace, Queen Biodu, enraged by the elders' defiance, ordered her guards to find Iro Lua 
she was determined to eliminate any threat to her rule, even if it meant using force. As days passed, fear gripped the village. The elders, aware of the danger, devised a plan to send Iroluwa to a distant land where he would be safe. Under the night sky, they set off, promising to protect him at all costs. The elders whispered among themselves, We must keep Iroluwa safe. He is our hope for a better future. Iroluwa, unaware of his destiny, asked, Where are we going? Why is everyone so worried? An elder replied, We are going on a journey to ensure your safety, my child. You are very special. As they traveled, they encountered challenges, but their determination never wavered. Finally, they reached the distant land, where they knew Iroluwa would be protected from Pimbiodo's grasp. The elders bid farewell to Iroluwa, saying, Remember, you are destined for greatness. Fulfill your destiny and bring light to our kingdom. Iroluwa, with courage in his heart, set foot on the new land, ready to face whatever lay ahead. And so their journey began, filled with hope, bravery, and the belief in a better tomorrow. Chaos erupted in the village as Queen Biodo's guard searched for the children of the elders. They went from house to house, but to their surprise, none of the children could be found. Confused and frustrated, the guards returned to the palace to report their findings to Queen Biodu. Upon hearing the news, Queen Biodu's fury knew no bounds. She raged and screamed, declaring that terror be unleashed and that all the elders be killed for their defiance. But when the guards went to release Terror, the fierce serpent that Queen Biodu kept as a pet, they found it lying stone dead in its quarters. Terrified, the guards hurried back to the palace to inform Queen Biodu of what they had discovered. She was stunned and bewildered. Terror had always been her most loyal companion, and she had trusted it completely. Now, it lay lifeless before her, leaving her feeling weak and vulnerable. In her grief and confusion, Queen Biodu retreated to the inner chambers of the palace, where she remained for a week. She was consumed by sorrow and anger, mourning the loss of terror and trying to make sense of what had happened. Her once formidable resolve wavered as she struggled to come to terms with the sudden turn of events. During her time in seclusion, Queen Biodo's loyal maids attended to her, offering comfort and support in her hour of need. They tried to reassure her that all was not lost, that she still had all the powers and resources at her disposal. But Queen Biodo could not shake the feeling of betrayal and defeat that gnawed at her heart. As the days passed, Queen Biodu gradually regained her strength and composure. She knew that she could not afford to dwell on the past or wallow in self-pity. There was still work to be done. And she was determined to reclaim her power and dominance over the village. With renewed determination, Queen Biodu sought counsel from her trusted spiritual advisor. Together, they performed rituals and incantations to strengthen her resolve and prepare her for the battles that lay ahead. Queen Biodu emerged from her seclusion with a steely glint in her eye, ready to face whatever challenges awaited her. But she never knew that the villagers and the elders were gathering strength of their own. The elders and the villagers were marshalling their forces preparing to confront Queen Biodu and put an end to her tyrannical rule once and for all. Queen Biodu woke up with a newfound sense of hope, determined to secure her reign as queen. However, her resolve was shaking when she had a terrifying nightmare. In her dream, she encountered a fearsome creature who warned her that her days as queen were numbered 
and urged her to change her wicked ways before it was too late. This creature's words haunted her and she couldn't shake the feeling of dread that lingered long after she woke up. As money dawned, Queen Biodu made a drastic decision. She resolved to crown her son as king, believing that this would solidify her hold on power and prevent anyone from challenging her rule. She ordered her guards to capture the kingmaker and two other elders, threatening to release terror upon them if they refused to comply. The guards swiftly carried out Queen Biodo's orders, seizing the kingmaker and the elders and bringing them to the palace. In a state of fear and confusion, the elders reluctantly agreed to crown Queen Biodo's son as king, unaware of the events unfolding around them. But when the guards went to summon the prince to be crowned, they made a horrifying discovery. The prince lay lifeless in his chambers, surrounded by a pool of blood. Shocked and horrified, the guards cried out in alarm, drawing the attention of everyone in the palace. Upon seeing her son's lifeless body, Queen Biodu was overcome with grief and shock. She collapsed, unconscious, and was quickly rushed to the palace physician for medical attention. Meanwhile, the elders, realizing the gravity of the situation, took charge and ordered the guards to prepare the prince's body for burial. As the palace descended into mourning and chaos, the villagers awaited news of what had happened. Rumors spread like wildfire, and whispers of foul play and treachery filled the air. The once mighty queen, Biodu, now lay powerless and vulnerable. Her dreams of securing her reign shattered by tragedy. But amidst the turmoil and uncertainty, one thing remained certain. The destiny of the village hung in the balance and the battle for its future was far from over. The village mourned the untimely death of the prince. Queen Biodu's once unshakable hold on power had been shattered, leaving the villagers reeling with shock and uncertainty. As preparations were made for the prince's funeral, the elders convened to discuss the future of the village. With Queen Biodu incapacitated, and her son no longer able to ascend the throne. They knew that a new leader would need to be chosen to guide the village forward. Despite their grief, the elders remained resolute in their determination to see justice served and Queen Biodu held accountable for her actions. They vowed to uncover the truth behind the prince's death and ensure that those responsible were brought to justice. Meanwhile, Queen Biodu remained unconscious, her fate hanging in the balance. The palace physician worked tirelessly to tend to her, but her condition showed no signs of improvement. The villagers whispered among themselves, wondering if this was a sign of divine punishment for Queen Biodu's wickedness. In the midst of the turmoil, a sense of hope began to emerge among the villagers. With Queen Biodu's grip on power weakened, they saw an opportunity for positive change and a chance to build a brighter future for their village. As the day of the prince's funeral dawned, the villagers gathered to pay their respects and bid farewell to their fallen leader. The elders led the solemn procession, carrying the prince's body to its final resting place with dignity and reverence. For even as they laid the prince to rest, the villagers knew that their struggle was far from over, with Queen Biodu still unconscious and the truth of her son's death shrouded in mystery. They faced an uncertain future filled with challenges and obstacles, but they also knew that they were not alone. United in their determination and resolve, the villagers stood ready to face whatever trials lay ahead and forge a new path forward for their beloved village. As the sun set on the day of the prince's funeral, 
a sense of quiet determination settled over the village. The elders vowed to continue their quest for justice and truth, knowing that the fate of their village depended on the courage and resilience. Queen Biodo found herself in a state of confusion and despair. She had a vivid dream in which she saw her late husband, who appeared to her with anger in his eyes. He questioned her actions and accused her of bringing suffering upon the people of Songo, their village. Her husband's words struck fear into Queen Biodo's heart, as she had never seen him so furious before. He warned her of impending danger if she continued her path of destruction and urged her to let the people have peace. With that, he vanished, leaving Queen Biodo shaken and troubled. As she awoke from her trance, Queen Biodo was filled with a mix of emotions. Confusion, fear and guilt gnawed at her as she grappled with the realization that her husband's words may hold some truth. For the first time since her son's demise, she felt a glimmer of remorse for her actions. Could this be true? She pondered aloud. Did someone actually kill my son? With newfound determination, Queen Biodo resolved to uncover the truth behind her son's death. She knew that she could no longer ignore the signs pointing to foul play, and she was determined to find out who had the audacity to take her son's life. With a sense of purpose driving her forward, Queen Biodo rose from her bed and washed away her remnant of sleep. She knew that she had to act swiftly to unravel the mystery surrounding her son's death and bring the killer to justice. As she made her way through the palace, Queen Biodo's mind raced with thoughts and questions. Who could have wanted her dead? And who could have wanted her son to die? And what secrets lay hidden within the shadows of the village? With each step, when Biodo's determination grew stronger, she would stop at nothing to uncover the truth and avenge her son's death, even if it meant facing the darkest depth of her own soul. Queen Biodo sought guidance from her spiritualist in her quest for answers about her son's death and the unrest in the village. But what she heard was far from comforting. Upon seeing Queen Biodo, the Habali sensed her grief and heavy heart. As Queen Biodo poured out her troubles, hoping for guidance, the Habalist speak cryptically, shaking his head as if troubled by what he saw. He told Queen Biodo that the gods of Songo were seeking revenge for the land priests she had killed and also for the innocent ones she also had shed their blood. He warned her that the spirits of all of them are crying out for vengeance and that more dangers locked around her. To Queen Biodo's shock and dismay, the Habalists revealed that the ghost had chosen someone else to lead the village, someone known to the elders. He urged Queen Biodo to apologize to her people and step down from power or face the consequences of defying the God's will. Desperate for a solution, Queen Biodo asked if there was another way, but the herbalist refused to be involved, fearing the wrath of external forces. With a heavy heart, and a sense of defeat, when Biodo left the shrine, her mind filled with confusion and disappointment. When Biodo returned to the palace disappointed by the lack of answers from her spiritualist. However, she decided to feign remorse and repentance in order to gain the trust of one of the elders and learn more about the chosen king. The elder was cautious not fully convinced of Wimbiodo's change of heart. Despite her efforts to appear remorseful, the elder treaded carefully, wary of Queen Biodo's true intentions. Days turned into weeks, and the weeks into months. As Queen Biodo continued her acts of contrition, she sought the attention and favor of the elders, pretending to care about the welfare of the village. 
Eventually, the elders began to trust Queen Biodu and confided in her about Irolua, the chosen king, and the family that had raised him. Learning of this, Queen Biodu's rage simmered beneath the surface. She resented the family for aiding Irolua's survival and secretly ordered her guards to eliminate them. The guards carried out Queen Biodu's orders without hesitation. And when news of the hunter and his wife's death reached the elders, they were filled with grief and vowed to avenge their deaths. As tension mounted and Queen Biodu's true nature began to reveal itself, the fate of the village hung in balance. Queen Biodu, fought by her anger and resentment at being replaced, searched tirelessly for Ireolua, the chosen king. However, the elders had secretly relocated him for his safety, unknown to Queen Biodu. Despite her efforts, Queen Biodu couldn't find Ireolua and returned to the palace, feeling deceived and frustrated. However, she kept up her pretense of normalcy, hiding her true feelings behind a facade of false smiles. Determined to meet Irolua and assert her dominance, Queen Biodu subtly requested to see him, but the elders deflected her request, claiming that Irolua would soon return to his stand and she could see him. Years passed and Irolua turned 18, the age deemed appropriate for him to ascend the throne of his father. He returned to the village and the elders took him to the shrine for fortification before his coronation. When Queen Biodu laid eyes on Irolua, her bitterness and resentment fled anew. She attempted to kill him on several occasions, but each time strange powers surrounded him, thwarting her efforts. In one such attack, Queen Biodu was struck with such illness that left her bedridden. Despite her illness, Queen Biodu's heart remained bitter and vengeful. Meanwhile, Iroluwa was finally crowned king with the help of the kingmaker. He ruled his people with love and zeal, determined to bring peace and prosperity to the village. As Queen Biodu lay incapacitated, the village looked to the future with hope knowing that they had finally had a true leader in Irolua. Irolua, now crowned king, tried his best to help Queen Biodu recover from her illness, despite the warnings from the elders that her sickness was from the gods. Irolua's compassionate heart urged him to make every effort to heal her. He sought advice from the village healers and offered prayers for her recovery. But sadly, Queen Biodu's condition only worsened with time. Throughout her illness, Queen Biodu remained bitter and arrogant, refusing to acknowledge her wrongdoings or seek forgiveness. Despite Irolua's attempts to show kindness and compassion, she remained consumed by her anger and resentment until the very end. Eventually, Queen Biodu passed away. Her bitter heart silenced forever. The village mourned her passing, but they also felt a sense of relief. Knowing that they were finally free from her tyrannical rule, they gave her a barrier befitting her status as a former queen, but her legacy of cruelty and oppression was not forgotten. With Queen Biodu gone, Songo was finally free from the shackles of her tyranny. The villagers thanked the gods for saving them from further suffering and prayed for peace to reign once more. Under Irolua's wise and compassionate leadership, the village thrived. He ruled with fairness and justice, earning the respect and admiration of his people. With his guidance, Songo enjoyed a newfound era of prosperity and harmony, and the villagers lived in peace for generations to come. And so our story comes to an end, with Songo finally liberated from the darkness of Quimbiodo's reign 
as the sun set over the peaceful village. The people looked to the future with hope and gratitude, knowing that they are truly free at last. The most important lesson is all about how being kind and compassionate is much more powerful than being angry and hateful. The story shows that Queen Biodo's mean attitude caused her to fail. Why Irolua's kind and fair behavior made him a respected ruler. It teaches us that treating people nicely can bring joy and harmony, but being angry or mean only brings sadness and problems. So it's important to be kind and loving because it makes the world a happier place for everyone. And with that, my dear friends, our story comes to a close. But remember, the magic of storytelling lives on, waiting to whisk us away on new adventures. We are the wonders of imagination, no no bounds. Goodbye for now, and may your dreams be filled with joy, wonder, and endless possibility. Thank you so much for watching. Please kindly comment, share, like, and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more interesting stories.